Those of you who have to. So tonight, we are looking at the test of the heart. So the question I want to pose tonight is, who controls you? Does everybody have your Bible? Or the Bible on your phone that you're actually looking at? All right, so first of all, who controls your words? James opens up the chapter with a warning, and he says, be careful what you say. So he says, those who teach are going to be held to a higher accountability. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. It says, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren or brothers or sisters, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment, for we stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. So what he's saying in these first couple of verses is that those that are called to teach or called to preach are going to be held to a much higher standard than those who are not. And the interesting thing about it is, like, whenever I first got called into ministry, I was terrified. I didn't want to do it. And I've told you guys this before because I didn't think that I was capable or qualified to stand in front of people and tell them what God is telling me or what he's trying to tell you. And so I was terrified. And honestly, I still am a little bit. Um, That feeling doesn't really go away because every time that we meet together, our eternity is being impacted. So whatever we talked about impacts our eternity. You know, how close you get to God or how far you get away from God if you feel conviction, those kind of things, every time that we come together, we are discussing eternity. So I always try to pray before service that God would speak through me and speak to me because it's terrifying. Like there's public speaking, which is scary, but then there's public speaking to where someone could repent and trust in Christ, and that's even more terrifying. You know what I'm talking about. It's a different kind of fear. But... Whenever I stand before you, because of this responsibility that God's put on me, I have to pray about it first. Like pray where God is leading me to teach, what he wants me to say, make sure that I'm saying the truth, that the Holy Spirit is leading me, and that I've got peace about it. Because if not, that can cause some serious problems. But I always get a little nervous because of that. You know, the weight of what we discuss, it impacts our faith. It it impacts our relationship with God and our understanding of the world and why people need Christ. And so what we discuss here is giving you guys the tools that you need to go and share the gospel with other people or giving you the tools to grow closer to God so it's easier for you to manage what's going on in the world. So verse 1 is a big warning for anyone that desires to be a teacher. Now, it's not saying don't be a teacher, but it's saying that if you really feel like God is calling you to that position, you need to pray about it and make sure you have peace because it's a major responsibility. Verse 2 is kind of comforting in a way, even though it's a, it's a warning of such. He says that no one that stands in the pulpit is going to be perfect. Surprise, none of us are perfect. I've got struggles, you have struggles, you guys over there have struggles. We have things that we deal with, some things we talk about, some things, some things we don't talk about. But we're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. But that shouldn't prevent us from prayerfully considering teaching or preaching or sharing the gospel or living out our faith just because we're not perfect. As we mature as Christians and grow closer to Christ, it makes it easier to guard our our words and our heart because we are building that relationship and we are developing spiritual fruit in our lives. And we talked about that a few weeks ago. But we all stumble. And that's, honestly, it's comforting because we don't have to worry about looking perfect in front of everybody. If you make a mistake, it's part of life. If you make a mistake, it's okay. But it's not good to stay there, but it's okay to, to deal with that because sometimes we're going to have moments where we lose our cool. Has anybody lost their temper today? I don't think I have, actually. Has anybody said anything that they regretted immediately after they said it? It happens. It happens to everybody. Robbie raised his hand every time. I don't need to ask what conversation you were having. But (laughs) maybe not. But the thing is, I mean, it's going to happen because we're not perfect people. We are going to stumble. But every time that we stumble, if we are a believer, it shows us an example of God's mercy and God's grace because he's willing to forgive us as long as we humble ourselves before him. And so you don't have to hold that baggage that is causing trouble in your life. You can give it to God and you can make sure that you are faithful to him. And then those times where you make mistakes, God's going to forgive you. And he's going to pick you right back up and you're going to go jolly on about your way again with, with Jesus guiding you. The big thing is that we need to continue to pursue God, even in those times of trouble, even in those storms that we have that we feel like we can't do anything right. Continue to pursue God and do everything that you can to guard your heart because that's the most important thing is to protect your heart. And by doing so, it protects what we say. And so if we're protecting our heart, that means that we're going to be a lot less likely to fly off the handle 
or to say something that we're going to immediately regret, and then that means we don't have to apologize as much. And here's the thing. Not every argument needs to be responded to. Just because somebody gets in your face and yells at you or says something that you disagree with, it does not mean that you have to engage in that argument. Sometimes the better thing to do is to just look at them and walk away. Or smile at them and say, I love you, and then walk away. It, it makes people feel weird, and then they leave you alone. Yeah, you don't need to insult someone just because somebody else is doing it. There is never an appropriate time to where we as believers put somebody else down to make ourselves feel good. We don't need to put someone else down just because we're trying to impress someone or trying to look cool or anything else, because none of that stuff really matters. And when you start putting other Christians down, it's going to hinder your walk with Christ because it makes you lower. And it keeps you from being able to hear what God is trying to say. But he used the word stumble. What does it mean to stumble? Do I know? Yes. Okay. So like to trip or something. But you know what he didn't say? He didn't use the word fall. You know what that means? When you stumble, you have the opportunity to correct yourself. When you stumble, that means you can catch yourself before you fall. You can hold on to something. And what God is telling us here through James is that we are going to have times to where we stumble, but we need to understand that we've got to correct that action before it becomes something that's going to cause us to fall. So that means, you know, we repent and we get right with God, and then if we have wronged someone else, we go and we make it right with them. And a lot of us, we say things and we do things that we don't realize hurt people because we're focused on ourselves, and we've got to make those relationships right. We need to reconcile with them. Or else we're going to struggle, and we're going to fall, and we're going to get involved in sin that was in our lives before we knew Christ. And so we have to protect ourselves. We should never allow ourselves to get so far removed from the voice of God that we fall back into sin and into bad speech. You need to be an example for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Because the alternative is much worse. There are people that purposely teach wrong doctrine because their goal in life is to deceive you. It's to put you down the wrong path. And they want to twist scripture to make God fit their agenda as opposed to them surrendering to God. And that really is what this verse is warning about. It's warning about false teachers. And we need to be careful as to who we listen to. When we study the Bible, and if you're called a teacher to preach, our opinion is not truth. That's the big thing I want you to understand right now is that just because you have an opinion does not mean that it is biblical. Just because you feel a certain way does not mean that it is justified by Scripture. And we've got too many people that stand in the pulpit to preach opinion, but don't preach truth. And so they're confusing people. And they're taking people down the wrong path, and they're making them believe in a God that is not really the God of Scripture. Some people are filling pulpits with an agenda to conform Scripture to and God to the image of the world. This is why you need to know your Bible. This is why you need to know what you believe. And here's the thing, when you go back to Genesis 3, and we talked about this several weeks ago, whenever Satan came and spoke to Eve, he didn't just tell her a flat-out lie. He didn't just do this brazen speech. He made her question God's goodness. He made her question God and said, did God really say that? When someone is trying to deceive you, they're not just going to be upfront about it. They're going to dress it up to where it sounds really good and it looks really good, even though it may not be the truth. It's going to be just enough to where you can believe that it's true, even though it's not. And so then they keep deceiving you on and on and on. But God said those people are going to be held accountable, and it's not going to be a happy occasion. They're going to stand before God, and he's going to judge them for everything that they said. And it's going to end in hell because they're not a believer. If they can stand on stage or if they can teach you false doctrine and false theology, it means they're not a believer because they're not studying Scripture and they're not listening to the Holy Spirit. But he says a little goes a long way in verses 3 through 5. Who likes garlic? Do you know like garlic? Yes, garlic. What I've learned about garlic is you either like it or you hate it. I thoroughly enjoy garlic, especially when you start sweating and you smell like garlic. Just kidding, but I love garlic. But the thing with garlic is that it's extremely strong, right? So you have to do it in small batches. So you can't just like pour an entire bottle of garlic powder on your spaghetti and expect to actually eat it because that stuff will literally take your breath away. You'll be like gagging on garlic. But James uses the example of small things here in verses 3 through 5 to talk about how it controls big things. So if you dump a whole bunch of garlic on your plate, you're no longer going to eat it, which means the garlic wins. Small batches of garlic. But let's look at verses 3 through 5. He says, Now if we put the bits in the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. 
Though they are so great and driven by strong winds, we are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. James uses this example of small things controlling much larger, stronger things. So the bit that goes in the horse's mouth is, what, about this wide maybe? A little piece of metal. I don't ride horses. Who rides horses? Anybody? How big is a bit? Yes, you. Okay, and what is the benefit of the bit? <laughs> to keep them in control. Who has a boat? What does the rudder do? You don't know what a rudder does? Jeez. Do you even have a boat? Okay. A rudder basically allows you to dictate which direction that, that boat's going to go. Has anyone ever had their mother snatch, up the, or snatch them up by their ear? Okay, we can talk about that one. What happens when your mama grabs your ear? It hurts, but what does it make you do? You will go wherever she yanks that ear. And just a scientific fun fact, it only takes about 12 pounds of force to rip off an ear. Just saying. So if you try to jerk the other way, you might be one-eared for, a long, for the rest of your life. But basically what happens is something so small as an ear or a rudder or a bit can control something massive. Just like your tongue. Your tongue can control who you are. And so the tongue is a small part of our body, but it has a tremendous amount of power. Our tongue can make people like us, but it can also make people hate us. It can persuade people to agree with you, or it can make them disagree. It can speak truth, or it can speak lies. It can dictate how our days go just based on how we interact with people. So if you walk up to someone and say, good morning, they're probably going to say good morning. But if you walk up to somebody and be like, I hate you, it's not going to go well. So it can completely impact your whole day. But the tongue itself is not alive. It's part of your body, but it's not alive. In the same manner that the bit in the horse's mouth and the rudder on the back of the ship, it must be controlled by something, so our tongue must be the same way. Our tongue must be controlled by something or someone. So who controls the words that come out of your mouth? You. Me? I control the words that come out of your mouth? I think that doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't work. I told you to say that. But the way you speak is a reflection of where your heart is. So the way you speak is a reflection of where your heart is. Jesus spoke these words in Luke chapter 6, verse 45. He said, The good person out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth what is good. But the evil person out of the evil treasures of his heart brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from which, his, which fills his heart. So whatever your heart is inclined to do, it's going to cause you to speak in that way as well. So let's continue on and look at taming fire. I don't play with fire anymore. Anymore? Yeah, I think I've told y'all this story before, but whenever Kayla and I lived in Lancaster, um, I was burning trash and set the neighbor's yard on fire. So I don't really do fire anymore. It was bad. Like, helicopters had to come in and fire trucks and everything else. But it was her fault. I'll tell you later. She's watching the live stream. She knows it. I'm sure I will. It was her fault. So let's look at verses 6 through 12. It, it was her fault. It says, so um, see how a great forest, or see how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. See? <laughs> <laughs> and the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and birds of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of a deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brothers produce olives or a vine produce figs, nor can salt water produce fresh. And so he explains that the tongue is like fire. It can be useful for things like cooking, staying warm, creating light, other things that you can do with fire. What else can you do with fire? That's not a good thing. Although I will say the next year their grass was as green as it had ever been. Slashing burn, slash and burn or whatever. But a lot of times fire can also get out of control and then it becomes a bad thing. It causes destruction, like my neighbor's yard. 
and it can burn houses down, and it can destroy relationships, and it can take people's lives. So fire is one of those things that if you don't understand, it can completely go out of control. And so he says the tongue can be used for praising God one minute, one minute and cursing your brother or sister in Christ the next. And he says this is not how it should be. And that's something that we've got to be careful about because we can get very in tune whenever the music is playing. And we want to praise God and worship our hands and do, or raise our hands and everything else. But as soon as somebody rubs us the wrong way, we're immediately talking bad about them. Or something I realized yesterday whenever I was at the school that if, if one person dates somebody else's boyfriend, then they talk bad about them because that's how drama works in, in high school and middle school. I'm just saying, there's no reason to talk about somebody's ex-girlfriend. Especially if they come to church here. It's just kind of ridiculous. But we should not be like this. We shouldn't praise God one minute and insult somebody the next, regardless of who they are. So whether they agree with you or not, whether they believe the same thing or not, whether they look like you or not, we should not be insulting them and worshiping God at the same time. When we worship God but insult each other, it builds division within ourselves. It causes division in the church. And that is not something that we're supposed to do as believers. So James gives us two examples in regards to how foreign worshiping God and hating people are. He starts with the water and he says that when you've got this well and you've got fresh water on one side and bitter water on the other side, it's impossible for it to flow. What happens when you mix, let's say you mix Kool-Aid with water. I mean, you make Kool-Aid with water. Why are you ooing? But anyway, if you've got purple Kool-Aid or grape and you've got clear water, what's going to happen when you mix them together? The water is going to turn purple, right? So if you take something that's really salty or bitter and you mix it with something that's fresh, what's going to happen? The water is going to become bitter. When we take our worship of God and mix it with hatred for man, it is going to make it into something that is bitter. And it is not going to be genuine worship. I don't know what that was. But anyway, and so we can't worship God one second and hate somebody the next. Because those things do not coincide within the life of a believer. And then he goes and talks about a fig tree and he says that, you know, a fig tree is not going to grow olives and a vine is not going to grow figs. And even if they were to combine a fig tree and an olive branch or whatever it is, it's going to be nasty. Could you imagine olive figs? That would be like fruitcake with olives in it or something. It would be disgusting. Yeah, it'd be nasty. And that's how God looks at our relationship whenever we don't praise him and love everybody else. Nasty fig olives. Follows. Yes. Don't have follows in your life. But that's, it's ridiculous to think that we can be a follower of Christ and we can hate people. It's ridiculous to think that we can love Jesus while we talk poorly about other Christians. So we can't do it. James said it's completely outlandish for us to even think that. And yet we've got so many people in the church who come to church on Sunday and they raise their hands or they speak and they teach or anything else. And then Monday morning, they're blasting people on Facebook or they're going and insulting people just because they don't agree with them. That is not evidence in the life of a believer. And we shouldn't be doing it. Just throwing that out there. A fountain cannot contain both fresh water and bitter water. A fig tree cannot produce olives. It makes olives and they're nasty. So when we try to mix worship and hate together, it'll never be glorifying to God. Never. It doesn't matter how good you look. It doesn't matter how loud you are when you do it. It doesn't matter if you can raise your hands all the way up here and almost touch Jesus. It is not going to glorify God. We have got to make sure that our heart is where it needs to be. We should always treat people how we wish to be treated, not how we think they deserve to be treated. Because when we treat someone worse than we treat ourselves, we are immediately saying that we are God and we are capable of judging them. It doesn't matter who they are or what they've done. We need to treat people the same manner that God treats us. And that's with grace and with mercy. And we clearly don't deserve it. And they probably won't either. But that's what we are commanded to do as believers in Christ. Every person was created in the image of God. That means you, me, the guy that's struggling with drugs on the corner, the lady that's struggling with everything in life because she doesn't know what she's doing, we should treat them with compassion. And we should treat them with love because that's exactly how God treats us. I asked you earlier who controls your tongue. The real answer is either God or your flesh. There's only two opportunities. The devil doesn't control your tongue. He just kind of entices you to do things. So you can't say the devil made me do it because it doesn't work that way. 
But if God controls your tongue, it will be like the fresh water fountain. It will be like the figs without the olives. It will be sweet fruit instead of weird, gross, salty, sweet fruit. But you're still going to have moments where you stumble, and that's okay. Like I said earlier, you're still going to have moments where you stumble, but you're not going to fall. Because you're going to pick yourself back up. Be quick to apologize if you stumble and reconcile. If you said something rude to someone, or if you've been disrespectful to someone today or in the last lifetime, you need to apologize. You need to repent to God, and you need to go, and you need to apologize to people. Because one of the worst things we can do as believers is allow our pride to get in the way and say that that person is not worthy of our forgiveness. Because Jesus says, if you don't forgive someone else, he's not going to forgive you. And it's more important for Jesus to forgive you than it is for you to forgive someone else. Because when Jesus doesn't forgive you, that means you don't have salvation. That means you were never saved in the first place. So we have to forgive the people that have wronged us if we expect God to forgive us. So don't let your pride get in the way. If your flesh controls your tongue, it will cause division and bitterness amongst people. Those of you that said something you wish you could have taken back today, how did it go over? Was it a happy conversation? Did they say, thank you for being a jerk? Or did they argue right along with you? (laughs) You can tell the truth without being mean. Part of it is, I agree. But, But the thing is, the way we say things can also cause division as well. But whenever we allow our flesh to control us, that means we allow our pride to get in the way. And it makes us arrogant. And we think that just because we may know the truth, we can present it however we feel like it. And it can burn a bridge instead of causing unity. And so those that allow the flesh to control their tongue will bring division instead of unity. Now, we are not supposed to shy away from speaking the truth. We are not supposed to shy away from telling them what Scripture says, but we need to do it in love. But we should never start trouble or drama just for the sake of starting trouble or drama. Let me tell you, I went to the high school yesterday. I stayed for all four lunches, which was like felt like six hours. And every table I sat down except for one had drama. Maybe. I don't know. No, it wasn't yours. It was a bunch of girls, which was ironic. But like there was one table I sat down to where they were about to fight because of some boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. So I tell you not to date until you're ready to get married. Then you don't have these problems. Because it takes a certain level of maturity to understand that your relationship with God is where it needs to be before you can start having a relationship with someone else. Because otherwise, your relationship with that person is going to hinder your relationship with God. And no matter how godly that person may be, they can pull you away from God. And your relationship with God is more important than anything else. And so until we have that foundational understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ and deep in our faith, we don't need to pursue other relationships because they're always going to pull us away. Little word, truth there for you. Don't date till you're ready to get married. But that's not what the sermon's about. It's about your words. But you should never be the one to start drama and you should avoid it as much as possible. Avoid it as much as possible. Love each other. Speak well of each other. And don't fall into the temptation of insulting one another. Insulting someone is never going to build a bridge. It's only going to hinder that friendship, unless you're like best friends and then you're allowed to do that, but that's beside the point. But we talked about your heart being an overflow of your tongue or your speech, but it also overflows through your actions. So who controls your actions? James begins verse 13 with a question. So let's look at verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior and his deeds, or good behavior of his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. So he's continuing this division between those who are controlled by the flesh and those who are controlled by the spirit. When he talks about wisdom and understanding, he's not asking you how to tie your shoe. He's not asking you if you can kill a deer. He's not asking you if you can solve the quadratic equation. Some of you can, some of you can't. We've proven that already. He's asking if you have gotten to the place in your life to where you have surrendered to Christ and you trust God more than you trust yourself. That's what he's, you can figure it out later, Braxton. We can work it out. But he's talking about, have you surrendered your life to Christ and are you willing to submit to God and depend on God and not on yourself? This wisdom points back to Proverbs 9.10, which states, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, 
and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So it's almost as if James took this verse and brought it into the New Testament to help us understand. So when we fear God, it means that we have a reverence for Him. It doesn't mean that we like cower in the corner and are afraid and everything else. It means that we have a genuine reverence for God. And what that means is like a feeling of profound awe and respect and love for God. We honor God. God is all-powerful and He's all-knowing, among other things, which means that He deserves our reverence. It means that He's worthy of our worship because He's our Savior. So in order to obtain true wisdom, it means respecting God and being obedient to His Word. If we believe that God is all-knowing, we don't need to argue with Scripture because God is right and we're wrong. If our opinion is different from what Scripture says, then we need to change our opinion and quit trying to change Scripture. Because if God is all-knowing, He wrote down what we needed, and we don't need to question that. It's common sense. What God said is true. So true knowledge and true wisdom comes from knowing God and knowing His Word. And here's the thing, too. If you have a relationship with God, but you never read your Bible and you never pray, do you even know who you have a relationship with? Do you? I mean, I can say I have a friendship with Spider-Man, but I don't know him. I can say I have a friendship with Alec, and I don't know him either. (laughs) You said something. See, who's Alec? Who's Alec? (laughs) But the thing is, that if we truly believe and trust God and we have a relationship with Christ, we have to read our Bible. We have to know who it is that we believe in, and we have to know what he says, or else we're going to be led away by false teachers. We're going to be saying things and doing things that are not glorifying to God, because we're being controlled by our flesh instead of being controlled by the Spirit. So we need to know what we believe, and we need to know who we believe in. Otherwise, we may as well believe in the Easter Bunny or something else. Conversation for another day. But the thing is, when we have that relationship with Christ, it leads us to be gentle with those around us and to do the right thing. It should never be difficult as a believer in Christ to do the right thing. It should never be this internal struggle to do the right thing, because we should be inclined to do that anyway. And so it can be a lot easier to not be gentle, which means power under control. That's kind of a really cool definition of gentle. That means it's kind of like the genie in Aladdin to where he's like this big, giant, powerful being, but he's in a lamp. Gentleness is kind of like having all of this power, but knowing how to use it appropriately. And so when somebody gets in your face and they fly off the handle and they argue with you, instead of you going right back at them, you can just stand there and take it and understand that they were made in the image of God, and you can love them anyway. Because how many times do we do that to God? And God loves us anyway. And so if we're going to be a follower of Christ, we need to be like Christ. And so when we grow in maturity, it leads us to not let our emotions control us, but to allow the Holy Spirit to control us, which means that we're going to do things that we don't normally do because we're going to be following Christ. We can practice self-control, and we can show power under control. So we may be able to respond with kindness instead of with hatred. We can't worship God and hate people. So let's look at the actions of a lost man. Let's look at verses 14 through 16. He says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant, and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is a disorder and every evil thing. So James paints this pretty abysmal picture of what, whose heart, or a person whose heart is controlled by wicked things. He says they're corrupt, they're argumentative, they're divisive. None of those things are, are nice things. None of those things are good things. So this man has a different kind of wisdom. He's got earthly wisdom, and James said that that wisdom comes directly from hell. So lost people, their wisdom, all the wisdom they think they have comes directly from hell because they're doing the exact opposite of what God is calling us to do. So James says it looks like jealousy. It looks like selfish ambition. What does jealousy mean? Anybody? It means you could be like someone or you want something that someone has and so it drives you to do things that you wouldn't normally do. What about selfish ambition? They're loud tonight. Selfish ambition is basically trying to get to the top and not worrying about who you bring down in the process. Putting yourself above and in front of everyone else. Neither one of those things are Christ-like. And he says that a person that's controlled by the flesh, they should not lie 
against the truth. So let's look at that. What does it mean, or what could it mean to lie against the truth? What could it mean to lie against the truth? Yes, sir. I'm looking at you. Okay, lie against the truth. So obviously telling a lie, but what is the truth that it's talking about? Anybody? Yes, sir. Okay, that's, I think so too. I think when James is using this phrase, he's basically telling us and warning us that if we're not Christians, we don't need to tell people that we are. Because if it goes back to what he's talking about with false teachers, if we claim to be Christians and yet we have never repented and actually trusted in Christ and there's no fruit in our lives, then we're not. And then we need to quit telling people that we are because when we do that, when we say I'm a Christian but we live like the world, what we're doing is giving Christ a bad name. Because people are looking at us and expecting us to live differently, but instead we're looking just like the world. And if there's no evidence that Christ is your Savior, if there's no spiritual fruit in your life, then chances are you're probably not saved. And that's what James is saying. He's saying if you have never repented and trusted Christ and there's no spiritual fruit in your life, quit saying you're something that you're not. Because you're lying against God. And that's a serious thing. And so there's people that are driven by self-ambition, that are constantly struggling with jealousy, are a direct contrast from who Jesus is. And if our lives look exactly opposite of Christ, then can we really claim to be Christians? If we truly are believers in Christ, we're at least going to look like him a little bit. Even when we stumble, even when we struggle, we're still going to look like Jesus. But if nothing in our life looks like Christ, then we really need to figure out who it is that we're following. And then he says that it causes disorder in every little thing or every evil thing. Without Christ, people in the church pursue things that are going to cause confusion and division, like arguing over the color of the carpet or arguing about what type of service we're going to have. What I've learned in life is there are a lot more people that love to complain about things but have no interest in actually helping fix the problem. And when somebody does that, that is not driven by Christ. That is driven by selfishness and jealousy and those things. So causing division in the body of Christ is not what we are called to do. We are supposed to be unified because all of us worship the same God. All of us are indwelled by the same Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit over here is not going to hate the Holy Spirit over here because he's the same person. And so one Christian cannot hate another Christian because you are indwelled by the same Spirit. And so we can't hate each other. It is impossible for the Holy Spirit to hate himself. And so when we have those issues to where we have to to where we have a disagreement, we need to reconcile or else it's going to cause division in the church and it's going to cause you to struggle in your spiritual life because you're trying to pursue something that is not Christ. And so we have to repent. We have to reconcile those relationships. And so God draws us closer to him. And when he does that, it causes us to care for people and have compassion for people, to pray for each other and to support each other. So let's look at the actions of a saved man. Verses 17 and 18. He says, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who makes peace. James finishes the chapter giving the qualities of what a person who has the wisdom and understanding of God should look like. So he starts with being pure. So what does it mean for someone to be pure? You guys are so talkative tonight. I'm just excited to hear what you have to say. What does it mean for someone to be pure? For something to be pure? Okay. Anyone else? What does it mean to be pure? Or for something to be pure? To be perfect. To have no flaws. To have no corruption or anything in their lives. If we go back to looking at the fountain... If the fountain has bitter water coming out of it with fresh water, is that fountain pure? No, because that fountain is corrupted. If we have sin in our lives that is causing us to abandon who we are in Christ, if we are allowing sin to be dominant in our lives, then that means that we can't be pure. And so we've got to rid that sin from our lives. When a person is pure, that means they're not corrupted by evil. They're not corrupted by selfish ambition or jealousy. They've got spiritual integrity And they've got moral sincerity. That means that we know what is right, we're going to do what is right, and we're going to love doing what is right. Because we are worshiping Christ and we want to glorify Him. 
They know what the right thing is to do, and they do it out of reverence for God. And from that purity, we see other things develop as well. And so he gives these traits. He says that you're going to be peaceable. That means we're not going to be seeking out drama. We're not going to be trying to start things and do these things that are going to hinder people from coming to Christ. That means we seek out unity in the body of Christ. He says they're gentle. They practice self-control. They're willing to endure harsh treatment and still love people. Jesus did that for us. They're going to be reasonable, which means that you're going to be teachable. You're going to listen when somebody talks to you. You're going to be willing to submit the truth, and you're going to use the knowledge that you have to make the right decisions. They're going to be full of mercy, which means willing to forgive, showing compassion or concern for those who are in pain or suffering. Then he says they're unwavering and without hypocrisy, which means you're standing firm on the truth of Scripture. We talked a while back about a double-minded man being unstable in all his ways. Those people that are really growing in their faith and depending on God are not going to be double-minded. They're not going to be wavering in their faith. They're going to trust what God has to say, and they're going to go about their business and do what God's calling them to do. So as I started tonight, I'm going to end. Who's controlling your speech and who's controlling your actions? I want to challenge you to do this. If your speech or your actions have caused there to be division amongst yourself and another person, whether it's today, the last week, or however, I want to challenge you to reconcile with that person. I want to challenge you to go to that person and apologize because that's what Christ is calling us to do. He calls us to build bridges, not to burn them. 